To me, what I'm talking about is saying, well, wherever you are, if you're the cheapest or you're the most expensive, wherever you are on that scale is to start charging more. And when you start to charge more, ideally to become the most expensive, it's a future-proofing strategy for your business. You probably know this already, but most business owners don't pay themselves enough. There are a bunch of different reasons for that, and we're going to be deep diving into this topic today on how to get paid what you're worth. And to help me out, I have with me Andrew Griffiths, the author of the author of Someone Has to Be the Most Expensive. Now, I've known Andrew for many a year. He's a constant on the Australian speaking circuit. And if you ever see an event where he's going to speak, buy a ticket for that event, he's been publishing books for 25 years. Indeed, he has had 14 bestsellers. His latest book is Someone Has to Be the Most Expensive, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Andrew, how are you? Hello, James. Thank you. Very impressive opening, mate. You've built built me up. I feel the pressure. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, this... Is is this your 14th book or your 15th book? It's my 14th book. It's yes. your 14th book. Now, why this one? Why now? It's a really, really good question. It's actually a book that I've been percolating on for 40 years. You know, in, in reality, it's something, it was a very big lesson that I learned years ago, this, this concept of charging what you're worth and uh, and the relationship between poverty mentality and undercharging all that stuff and 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 what what i've noticed over the years particularly in the last 10 or 15 years is so many businesses that are really 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 good at what they do and yet they just don't charge what they're worth and 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 the result is that they have this business that that is constantly struggling they're never really earning what they should be earning they're burnt out they're fried all of those kind of things and there's no change in sight and I've noticed in the last maybe 10, maybe 15 years even, that this is becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. And uh, finally, you know, this book, is, as I said, has been percolating. Um, last year, it was like, okay, now I need to be writing. I need to publish this book because it's very, very current. And, uh, and, and it really is. The, the response I've had to it has been extraordinary around the world um, with people who just going, oh, my God, this is written for me. I'm sick of doing everything for nothing. I'm just not. I'm just not earning what I should be earning for the effort and experience that I'm putting into my business. Because if we go back in time, if we go back to the uh, the back in time for Andrew Griffiths, uh, you grew up in a small town, didn't you? Or or at least a no. Well, not really. I mean, I, I had one of those unusual childhoods, you know, where I was an orphan and I kind of lived in an out of state care and. Um, you know, had had a bit of an icky kind of childhood. And, and that actually impregnated in me or imprinted, I don't know, impregnated, imprinted <laughs> in me a fairly low self-esteem and uh, and probably low self-worth. And I, I tend to say, you know, I spent the first 17 years of my life, 18 years of my life being told that I have little value and the, the rest of my life trying to prove differently. And this is a big part of this gig, right? Because a lot of people, your your self-worth is really tied into your net worth. You know, one way or another, I, I believe. And, but I bought my first business when I was seventeen, going on eighteen, James, and it was a dive shop in Sydney. And I bought a business thirty kilometres from the ocean, so that probably tells you a lot. <laughs> Everything you need to know about my business acumen in that one sentence, um, you know, came out there. But I bought a business, and I had, you know, a pop. I had no idea what I was doing. Like most of us, when we start a business, you know, you've been in business for forever. You, you know what it's like. We we blindly fall into it, and I just happened to blindly fall into it. But I, but it was a. I, I I had a very big poverty mentality. The guy I bought the dive shop from had a poverty mentality. So the whole business was run cheap. It was all about cheap, 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 cheap. And we lived up to that motto. You know, we we our gear was cheap, our dive instructors were cheap, our boat was cheap, everything was cheap and nasty is probably you know the, the best way of looking at it. And of course, it was a business that never made any money. It was a disaster uh, until I finally overcame this this realization of you know being the cheapest is what you've got to do and all these other stuff. And I kind of turned around my own poverty mentality to become the most expensive. 
And of course, there's a big, you know, I, I say that in one sentence, there was a lot that changed in there, <laughs> but it transformed my world and it, and it has ever since. Well, that's why I was talking about going back to the to the younger Andrew, because he said it was 40 years in the making. And I remember us talking about you having a, a scarcity mindset or a or a poverty or a poverty mindset, mm. operating a business, operating in a business where there wasn't much demand for that business. Indeed, putting setting up a dive company 30 kilometers from the from the ocean. That's I, I, that's crazy. I think I was waiting for sea level to rise. It just didn't, <laughs> didn't happen fast enough, you know. Yeah. That's my that's my standard corny joke, you know. <laughs> but but it's 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 an interesting kind of a thing, isn't it? You know, like most of us, our our upbringing influences our relationship to money, you know, one way or another. If you've brought up in a family or a household where where money is an issue, you know, and there's fights or arguments about money or there's not enough, you you can carry that poverty mentality into your business if you're a business owner. And, and that's when we, we find it difficult to charge or to have money conversations. I find people that are creative, you know, they're, they're the worst creatives who, who really undervalue what they do, you know, and, and, and I see so much of this, James. You know, people, as I said before, people are really, really awesome at what they do, yet they just can't either have money conversations or have confidence in themselves to charge what they're worth. If they find it easy, they assume that it's not worth much. Absolutely. And the funny thing is, is everybody else finds what they do really, really hard. That, that's right. Well, my first book that I wrote was about marketing, 101 Ways to Market Your Business, came out in two, 1999 type thing. And I looked at that and I just remember, oh my God, this is just such basic marketing stuff. I was running a little marketing company and you know, my advice was just really simple, easy marketing stuff for small business owners that had no idea about marketing. Back in the days, you know, when we used carrier pigeons and fax machines <laughs> and, and, and I'd look at it and go, this is just too simple. It's too dumb. You know, 300,000 copies later, you know, yeah. of, of that particular book, it was the most successful small business marketing book written by an Australian author ever, you know, and, and, and the reason being was simply because it, it gave people, you know, simple answers to what were complicated problems for them. And so you're right, we, what we know, what we figured out, we undervalue it, it completely. And, uh, and we think, well, why would anyone want to pay for that? You know, and certainly why would anyone want to pay a significant amount for that? I also think it's an interesting time right now because uh, inflation is relatively high, not the highest that it's ever been, but it's definitely a concern for a lot of people. And uh, I did notice the other day, Andrew, I went to buy a cafe soy latte. So and it $25? Was, uh, it, was, it was $6.20. And, yeah. uh, and uh, that was well and above, above my expectations. That was when I went, okay, inflation is real. Um, but it's also, I imagine, important at this particular time because our expenses are going up, which well, means that if we're not going right. raising our rates, we're in trouble. Well, and there's a couple of angles to this too, mate, you know, on where I'm coming from. The when I when I wrote this book, we we didn't have, you know, this rapid inflation and all the rest, but it was coming. It had to. We've got to pay for COVID in some shape or form, right? It, it, I don't think anyone's a rocket science doesn't didn't realize, you know, it, it didn't take much to realize there was a cost to pay for injecting and keeping up the economy going all around the world. But but a few different areas. The concept that I'm actually talking about is what I would call as a future proofing strategy. When businesses start to actually ch charge what they're worth, which means ideally you're the most expensive. If you're the most expensive at what you do, you, you kind of separate yourself from the pack. And it means that there's all these other people fighting over here at the cheapest end of town. And there always will be those people that are fighting there where there's no loyalty, where, you know, it's there's always someone who's going to be cheaper than you who's going to come along and take away. There's all that fight going on here. Yet I've realized over the years that the up top end of town, the most expensive end of town, it's kind of smooth sailing. There's not a lot of people up there because to be honest, most people don't have the balls to be at that end of town, to be you know, really, really brutally honest about it. To me, what I'm talking about is saying, well, wherever you are, if you're the cheapest or you're the most expensive, wherever you are on that scale is to start charging more. And when you start to charge more, ideally to become the most expensive, it's a future-proofing strategy for your business. Because when you're at that top end, and I've been at that end, for many years now, what happens is when there's global financial crisis and COVIDs and that, your business actually doesn't miss a beat. 
My business didn't miss a beat during mm. during during COVID, and I lost two hundred thousand dollars worth of speaking jobs. I just just kilted and did you know in other ways during the global financial crisis. My business boomed because I was at dealing with clients that weren't impacted immediately by rising costs, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why this being the most expensive is is the motto. There's a lot to that. But at least, as you said, you've got to be able to be putting up your prices now because there are businesses out there who aren't putting up their prices because they're fearful of losing their customers. And I guarantee that if you haven't put up your prices in the last 12 months in amongst the rising costs, you're probably becoming marginal. And in fact, you may even be running at a loss and not even realize it because a rising cost associated with utilities, labor, rents, blah, 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 everything else, you know, um, in the scheme of things. So it's not just a nice thing to do. This has actually become essential, even if it's counterintuitive to say all the costs are going up. Oh my God, if I tell my customers I'm putting up my prices, I'm going to lose some customers. Yes, you are. You're going to lose some customers, but you're probably going to lose the customers that you need to lose. And most of us know what that's like. I can guarantee everyone listening, watching has got four or five customers on their books that go, oh my God, I'd love to lose them. Put up your prices <laughs> and that will be done for you. It is the best process. Yeah, but- we, we're often banging on about being more selective uh, in our training and in our tech platform. We have uh, training on how to use triage tools to be able mm-hmm. to uh qualify the different people that are coming into your world. And there is this funny mindset where it's, oh, well, if I put up these barriers, I'm going to get less clients. If I get less clients, I'm going to be in trouble. The reality is, is that when you put up more select, when you put up more barriers and you decide to be a little bit more selective, you actually attract more clients. Completely. Completely. Yeah, I I, I agree a hundred percent. You know, the line that I love is when someone says, oh, you've been referred to me by James. And uh, he said that you're um, you're the most expensive, but you're the best. Excellent. And because that's what people are looking for. When you start to deal in quality, when you start to go up that price barrier, there's an expectation. Now, you can't be the most expensive and be crap at what you do. That's why McDonald's can't sell hamburgers for $25. <laughs> Yet there are hamburgers that sell in, in Las Vegas for $5,000, mm. you know, and they walk out the door, right? It's, it's, it's all understanding that that the more you charge the more value you've got to bring you know being i i use this caveat uh, someone's got to be the most expensive you know if you know why not make it you but on the inside of the book i say but if you're going to be the most expensive you have to be the best <laughs> and, and this becomes that lifelong kind of ambition and and my passion is to study these businesses that are the best and it might be someone who's making cheese, someone who makes thousand dollar sunglasses. These are a brand called Chrome Hearts. It's I've got a friend of mine who makes timber inserts that go into Rolls Royces. You know, mm-hmm. like I've got a photographer mate of mine in um, who's an Australian guy who lives in America, Peter Lick, who not so long ago sold three images for ten point four million US dollars at a time when everyone says, "Oh, well, digital photography, everyone's giving it away." You know, mm. these are all extreme examples and, and I kind of get that. But everyone in business, if you think, if you if you can say to me that you are really good at what you're doing, I guarantee that you undercharge for what it is that you do. And as a speaker, James, when I'm, I present in front of thousands of people, as you know, I ask this question, who here in the room undercharges for what they do? You know, or who here feels that they don't charge enough mm. for what they do, whatever the language might be? 95% of people put up their hands. Now, that's an interesting kind of response. And I've done that now for, I don't know, thousands upon tens of thousands of people. That And, and you ask, why don't you charge what you're worth? Oh, because I, I don't my, I don't think my customers can afford it. Um, times are tough. Um, you know, oh, you know, it's, it's competitive. Um, I'll lose all of my customers. All of these things. And I go, well, if, if you're going to lose all your customers because you put your prices up, then you haven't got them. Yeah. They're, they're not actually your customers. Let's, let's, let's unpack that a little bit because that's mm. the one I get all the time. My customers can't afford it or my customers are just not willing to pay that amount because they've been conditioned elsewhere that these are the rates that they should pay. Those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, 
when we're talking about value, there's two acronyms that we talk about, and, and I, I guarantee you're going to know about one. Uh, you might know about both. The first one is ROI, mm-hmm. obviously return on, re, re, return on investment. Uh, if we're going to charge, you know, if we can... If we can demonstrate the ROI, it's much easier to charge more. The other one is COI, and that's uh, cost of inaction. Mm, yeah, and so the, the negative push if we don't do this, right? Yeah, yeah If right. you don't do this or you don't hire the best, uh, these are the consequences that, that, that are related to that. Interesting. And, and COI, uh, ROI comes in all sorts of different forms. It comes in, it comes in the form of... Uh, you know, you're going to get more time, you're going to get more money, you're going to get more joy, you're going to get more this, you're going to get more that. Uh, COI is, is all sorts of different things as well. It's like, if you don't do this, this bad thing could happen, this other bad thing could happen, or this bad thing could happen. And one of those bad things is um, in the in the pricing thing is that you get a shoddy product mm-hmm. uh, or service. The other thing is that uh, things go so slowly that you don't make the progress that you want to make. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I agree with that. I, I also kind of think though too that that we 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 need to reinvent our relationship with value, you know, and understand what value we bring to the to to the interaction. Like we we tend to be product or uh, or service focused. You know, I buy that product or I buy that service from you. So I do business coaching. You know, I obviously sell programs, and you know, people people work with me you know, a lot. And, and, and I, you know, I deliver value. And, and I think that we look at that and go, okay, so you buy my, my book at $35 and, and I get value. Well, sure, that's a simple product. But actually, value is now measured in different ways. And we're a totally value oriented world where more and more people are looking for value and they're prepared to pay for it. That's the growth market. The cheap end of town is actually becoming smaller because people know that, you get what you pay for. But understanding what value is, we, we dive into product. Is this product of value? Is this service of value? To me, the value that we don't measure that we need to be measuring is, is other stuff. And it's things like our, our credibility, our reputation, our experience, our expertise, our consistency. You know what? I get told all yeah. the time, Andrew, you're so consistent. I've been watching you, working with you for 20 years, 25 years. You never change. You, you turn up, you're professional, you deliver. You're always, always the same. I haven't gone off and started, you know, selling spice racks, you know, and vitamins and, you know, doing, you know, consistency and there's great value in consistency. Things like creativity, the opposite of consistency. You're coming up with new stuff. The people value that. Your energy, like, you know, I get engaged all the time because of the energy that I bring to the table, right? Like, mm. you know, you know it, it, those kind of things, expertise and experience I mentioned, people like to know that you've got experience, but they also know that like you've got unique ex- expertise. Um, th- there's a lot of different ways of measuring that. Are you fun to deal with? We underestimate stuff like that. Yet who wants to, to do any kind of coaching work or you know, any, any that kind of stuff with someone who's just a miserable sod to deal with. You know, Chinese proverb, man without a smiling face should never open a shop. You know, my question is, why do so many miserable bastards open them? Yeah. You know, um, but, but the bottom line is you focus on your product and say, oh, well, that's worth $34. Maybe I'm not trying to make five bucks out of selling a book. I'm trying to turn a book into a $25,000 coaching program. So everything else that I do about my expertise, my consistency, my credibility, my, you know, all of that stuff, my old brand, that's what I've been building on for for decades. That's the value that I bring. And that's what enables me to to run the global business that I do. That's that, you know, I charge what I work, what I'm worth. So, so what is your relationship with value? Do you are you just on your product or service, or what are the other areas? And look at the people that you're prepared to pay more for, whether it be a restaurant or or buying a Maserati. It's the value that they bring. The product's got to be good, sure. The service has got to be good, but that's just one part of the equation. And I think when we get that, we go, well, you know what? We sell a great product, but we're but every other thing we do value what we can't return a phone call. You know, we're, we're miserable sods. We're, we, yeah. we, we don't have energy. We have all of that stuff. All you've got to product, your transaction is no different to everyone else. So you've got to have the whole package in my view. 
I remember um, going to a conference. A uh, woman's uh, was called uh, Simone Novello. Mm-hmm. Great person, great human. And it was on uh, strategic marketing alliances and partnerships. Mm-hmm. And we're all in this room and uh, people were thinking, but what do I have to offer? Now, this was for the purpose of forming a partnership rather than selling something, mm-hmm. uh, uh, joint ventures, cross-promotional stuff. And it was really interesting because there was two halves to the equation. There was there was something that was quite transactional, which is where I began when I talked about ROI and COI. Mm-hmm. Like the higher the ROI, the, the more the, the more that we can charge. And uh, as we got around the room, she began to say, like you, Andrew, what about the other stuff? What other, what other value can you bring? And everyone in the room was actually a little bit shocked, a little bit dumbfounded. No one really knew what to say, including myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm very rarely lost for words. But however, and then she came over to me and she said, well, James, you're extremely likable. Yeah, uh, you are. And <laughs> well, it, it feels weird saying it. She says, you do good webinars. Uh, you can speak to a whole bunch of people on the other side of the world in other rooms and they feel like you're in the same room together. And she went on in, in, to, in terms of those, those sorts of things. And she, then she went around and did that with most people in the room. And it was quite astonishing because everyone in the room, no matter how experienced they were, really struggled to be able to identify some of those things that you talked about that you defined as value the credibility, whether they're fun, whether they're consistent, whether they bring energy, whether they bring a a unique experience. How can we help our people extract all this extra value and goodness that, I don't know, as humans, we struggle to see in ourselves? You know, it's a really awesome question because, because people do struggle with that. And that's actually one of the things that I do as well with my people that I work with is I help them to see that thing that's in them, that's a value. And it's very true. What she said about you is right. You are a really nice bloke and you are, you're fun, you're engaging, you're easy to talk to, you're easy to work with. But James, you've been like that ever since I first met you. You have never been any different. You've always been that same guy. It's why you got a successful business, right? Because people would want to work with you. Now, if you were grumpy and irritable and, and just get off the phone, I'm just about to make a dollar, I'm all of that kind of stuff. Man, you know, you'd be driving a 1964 Hyundai, you know, <laughs> you know, and and you would still be there. So I, we've got to. We, what is our thing? And there's a few ways of understanding what this is, and it's critically important because we've got to incorporate that into our into our collateral, into our social media. We've got to do more of the value stuff. One thing is, what do people say about you? Now, I, as an example, I, I got told a lot that I'm extraordinarily consistent. Now, I, I used to push back on that a bit, right? Because to me, it sounded like I was, that's, are they kind of saying I'm boring? You know? <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like you've got a great face for radio, you know, like, you know, like, because I hear, I've heard it a lot and I go, and I would start, start calling people, are you telling me I'm boring? No, no, so, no, no, this is a compliment. Yeah, you know, every coaching session, I've had coaching clients for 10 years, every session I've ever done with you, I turn on Zoom, you're there waiting, fully prepared, Totally present, engaged, bang, chum. We have fun, we do it, bang. And I said, I'm, I've never met anyone so consistent. Every one of my speaking clients for the last, you know, 25 nah. years, bang. Andrew, you're the total pro. I, we Once we book you, we never have to give it a second thought. You, you, you know, and that doesn't happen accidentally. You know, that's that happens through hard work. But you listen to the feedback and you ask people, James, like, like why do you do business with me? You know, give me three words. You know, <laughs> and, well, and 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 you know, people will give you that if you ask enough people and you ask them the right question, you will get the same pattern. You'll hear the same the same thing, but sometimes said in slightly different ways, right? But it's the same thing, and you'll be able to say, "Well, people really like my energy." I again, I get told all the time, I, "We, you're on the project because we want your energy." Yeah, really? Like I, I don't know what my energy is because it's this is just normal, right? But, but I've learned to understand that people value energy if there's a room full of people that are low energy, right? So, so, so you've got to look for those key words. You've got, to, you've got to be a bit investigative and you've got to be okay to ask people those kind of questions. And you start to do a value map and go, well, there are 10 kinds of value. Which ones am I really renowned for? Which ones are people saying they like? 
but which ones do I need to work for? So I might be all of these awesome things, but you know what? I can't return a phone call. I can't return an email. I'm not, I'm not kind of trustworthy from that sense. If I fixed up my trust, work, you know, you're a nice bloke, but you know, you're a bit irritating because you never return my call, blah, blah, blah. If I could fix that, my trustworthy scale would be through the roof. I could charge more. So I think knowing how we're valued is one thing, but also knowing how we can improve that is another thing. Yeah, I think as an, as an easy first step, because I'm always trying to think of like what would be an easy first step. Mm. And I saw, I've seen people do this on social media over the last couple of years. And uh, I don't know, maybe they've been reading your book. Uh, but uh, I've started to see people pose the question, uh, you know, what do you think are my greatest commercial strengths? Hey, hey, friends on social media, what do you think are my greatest commercial strengths? Why do you like working with me? And uh, they get a whole bunch of answers. And it's interesting when you see that because you'll see some of the answers just coming up again and again or you see someone say something and three other people go, that's what I was going to say. Exactly, exactly. I, yeah. I think I think the toughest thing uh, for that particular idea or strategy, popping something on social media where you say, hey, what do you think are my greatest commercial strengths? The, the toughest thing I suspect is that most people would be afraid to hear what other people might say. Yeah, I think they are, but... but- I also think it's something you can do in your day to day. You know, you can do it. I've, look, I've done this over the years a number of times. I might do it with my coaching clients. I might do it um, with my speaking clients. I might do it in small groups that I offer. I might do it as part of a program to illustrate how to do it for others to go and do it. Give me your feedback. You know, if I've got a small speaker training group of 25, 30 people, you know, okay. To find out what your strengths are as a speaker, I want you guys to tell me what do you see as my strengths as a speaker? I'll ask that question in our private group. Then you know you go to your connections and start doing the same thing. But you you, you gotta you gotta know, you gotta, you know, to be successful in business, you know, which is really what I talk about, right? That's my whole thing. How to be more successful, it's simple as that, and how to build a business that's gonna be here for a long time. That's my kind of thing. Um, you've got to be prepared to do a bit of soul searching and not just focus on the product and service that you have, you know, that you're offering because we're human beings and we, we want to deal with human beings. And, you know, we do business with people we like, you know, we do business with people we value, we respect, all of those kind of things. When it comes to charging more for what it is you do and moving yourself up that sliding scale, it's really simple. The more value you offer, not just the product and service, assume that you're awesome at that, but the more value you offer, the more you can charge. The better your business is going to be, the longer it's going to be around, the more profitable it's going to be, the more freedom you're going to have. You know, all, all of the boxes that you want to tick come come into sliding up that scale and value is an integral part of that. The more I'm thinking about this, the more I'm uh, thinking about more practical and practical ways to, to find out some of these key strengths. We can ask our life partners we can ask our colleagues that we work with we can ask our friends i was also thinking andrew we have a uh, we use an onboard an onboarding form we've built out an onboarding form using our technology and when somebody uh, buys a product or service from us we say we ask questions like what was the thing that got you across the line great question or, yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, um there's another question there like what almost stopped you yeah 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 that's right what <laughs> Why did it take you so long? Yeah, why did it, why did it take you so long? Because uh, the inverse of that, finding out why people hire you, you said it before, sometimes we do have weaknesses to that do not complement our strengths and sometimes it is worthwhile finding out what those things are because they're the bits that, need to, that we need to fix that elevate us to the next level. Or the relationship changes, you know. You were really consistent, now you're not. You were really good energy. Now you're not. And that's where, when, when your value changes all of a sudden, you take on too much work. Who's been too busy? And you, you know, what you, you, your service drops, your value drops in terms of what you're delivering. You know, so that's important. But, but what I would like to lead into, James, briefly is to talk about like, okay, we've spoken about increasing value, but then how do you use that to actually grow? You know, how do you, how do you start to charge more once you kind of got your head around this stuff? And, and, and I think one of the most important messages that I would like to get out of this that I write a lot about in the book is, is, is 
we've got this story that we're telling ourselves in business and most of it is probably fiction about can people charge can't they you know can they afford it can't they afford it the markets this all those we tell a whole pile of stories and we charge accordingly we've got to start to change those stories in our own head that's how you change a poverty mindset and uh and that's to start look and say well i've got all this feedback from people saying that i'm actually pretty darn good at what i do you know i charge um as a speaker i know the first speaking job I did, I got paid $250 and I was amazed that anyone would pay that. Um, I, I write in in the book about a time that I got paid $35,000 for two days worked. Um, that changed my, you know, my mentality and my approach. You know, that we've got to change that internal story about we're worth it. The second thing though, that we've got to understand is we've got to start to tell other stories and we've got to tell different stories because you can't just put lipstick on a wombat. And what I mean by that is you can't just triple your prices tomorrow without any kind of change because it just doesn't actually work. We've got to believe that we're worth more, change our internal dialogue, but we've also got to change our external story. And that means we've got to tell people a better story about who we are, what we do, why they should be buying from us. And that's where we illustrate the value that we bring to the table, where we illustrate our expertise, where we illustrate, you know, what it is that makes us unique, you know, where we illustrate the illustrate the, the inherent value around who we are and what we do and why we are the best. And, and this is a reducing risk for the buyer kind of concept and strategy, because that's what everyone is doing with every single transaction is a risk analysis. And you've got to make it so there is no risk whatsoever for the person who's buying from you because you are, you know, you're, you're worth whatever you're charging, wherever you are on that sliding scale. And that's the key. You know, once you, you, you've you kind of removed the risk element where there's, you're so credible, they're going to buy from you because they know it's a safe bet. Your business is future proof. So it's really is as simple as that, as long as you can keep doing it. So there was an, there was actually an evolution of lessons there, which actually helps us bring this home. But in terms of some of the themes that we talked about, one of those one of the bigger themes that we've talked about is uh, is understanding your value, and sometimes that requires external input. Sometimes we're aware of our value. Sometimes sure. that's external input, and we're talking about things that are bigger then I have a degree from a university or, you know, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a combination of different factors. If we can articulate our own value, and I like the idea of, a, of, of, of mapping it out, we can then change some of the stories in our own head. And if I bring this back to the very beginning, <laughs> Andrew was <laughs> working 30, 30 kilometres from the coast. I don't know what that is in miles, but it's a long way for our American listeners. Uh, running a dive shop, coming from uh, from a, a, a scarcity mindset, a poverty a poverty mindset, and we need to change the stories in our head. And I can see that that would be so much easier if we'd start to map, map our values. If we have a value map, we can start to change the stories in our head. Then it goes a little bit external, and we have this wonderful me metaphor: lipstick on a wombat. You can't just put lipstick on a wombat. You have to reframe what it is that you're doing. I mean, like even the cover of this book is glorious, you know? Uh, you have to change what it is that you do from an external perspective. So it might begin with a little bit of soul searching, retelling, reinventing the stories in our head, sharing those stories externally, illustrating all these different new ideas and concepts that we've brought to the world. And in doing so, we de-risk it for the buyer because that's what sales is all about. It's about the transfer of certainty. And that's the beginning of uh, getting to a point where you are the most expensive because somebody has to be the most expensive. Any final words of wisdom, Andrew, before we wind this up? My, my words of wisdom, uh, the, the last thing I would say is, is that, that the journey to becoming the most expensive is not for the faint of heart, right? Because along the way, you're going to lose stuff. You know, like you, you'll lose some customers. You're probably going to lose some of your team. You know, you, if you've got a business that, that is focusing on being the cheapest or not charging what you're worth, so much changes. Not everyone can make the transition, but you lose the things you need to lose, right? Mm. What you so so quite tip, if I'm coaching a business to start charging what they're worth, I, my first thing is we're going to dip in revenue first. 
because that's what happens. You lose some customers, you know, you do, but when you do the up, you know, what you end up with, you replace them with the customers you should have. And you end up with a much, much better business that is going to so much more profitable that gives you all of the stuff you want, the freedom, the security, the, the ability to be more philanthropic, whatever it might be. So, so what that means is most people blink the minute they get a little bit of pushback from a client. Like I worked with a lawyer a little while ago and, and we put up her prices by 20% because she was dramatically undercharging, you know, and I get a frantic phone call, you know, week one. Going, oh my God, I just had a client who, who said, oh my, they freaked out because we're putting up our prices and they said they're leaving. I don't think we should put our prices up. And I said, tell me about the client. Oh, it's Mary Jones. I said, she's a great <laughs> client. No, we hate her. And I go, well, you say thank you very much and goodbye. You know, <laughs> she's just made room for a great client. Now, six months later, my lawyer has made an extra $300,000 in revenue all right, with no extra effort, changed her client base. She said, why didn't I do this five years ago? Why didn't I do this? And she said, the panic set in on week one and two, but we held still, and now our business is completely transformed. So you just got to be brave enough to, to walk your way through it. And it is a process to go from where you are to where you need to go. And that's, that's what this book is. It explains that process. How do you go from here to there? It's a big topic. Um, it's, but- it's it's a, it's a big it's a big topic. It's a slightly fat book, but it's a but it's a very enjoyable read because it was written <laughs> by the one and only Andrew Griffiths. Guys and gals, if you're sick of dealing with clients that are not the right fit for you, that drag on your time, drag on your energy, always complain about the price, never pay you enough. Hey, there's a lesson in that, isn't it? Maybe, maybe you could increase your your rates. Focus on a smaller set of clients that bring you a whole lot of joy. You end up delivering a better job while doing less. More money delivering more value while doing less. That's a triple win. Who doesn't want that, right? Who doesn't want that? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your time. James, always a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Uh, That was a great chat. And uh, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Uh, It's, yeah, just just a very, very cool conversation. Now go on to Amazon by Someone Has to Be the Most Expensive by Andrew Griffiths. Be like Arnie and do it.